Okay, everyone. Hello, my name is Sae. I'm so delighted that you've decided to spend your Thursday evening um, with me um, as I go on and on about how amazing Project Swallowtail is. So thank you so much. So my name is Sae and I'm a block ambassador for Project Swallowtail. And um, my whole life except work revolves around gardening. Almost everything that I do somehow is whether I'm drawing, whether I'm going someplace, whether I'm um, uh, entering competitions, it's always to do with gardening. So it is truly a passion of mine. But I'd like to begin this session with uh, land acknowledgement to acknowledge that I live and work on traditional territory of many indigenous nations in the area known as Toronto that has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous people. I acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that this, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to garden on this land, share its stories and realize that my gardening can create landscapes that work towards healing the land and people. And it is with that context, I want you to think of this presentation. So as I speak of the land, this is the land I'm referring to in 2004 when we moved to this house. Um, it was a very typical, turf grass, a couple of little bushes, and that's it. And over the past 18 years, I've turned it into a really nice thriving ecosystem um, with um, lots of amazing relationships and plants. And um, I want to share how you too can take the steps towards doing that. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is uh, how I got to know about Project Swallowtail, what's so special about native plants, um, how does Project Swallowtail work, and what would you, if you decide to make that plunge and join me in this amazing adventure that is seat sitting, what that would mean for you. Um, and examples of community engagement that um, I have uh, been involved with along with my amazing uh, group. And we'll have a question answer period at the end. At any time, should you need to, you know, you want to put in a question, uh, type it into the chat and uh, we'll, that will get a priority at the end of the session. Let's get started. So, I got to know uh, Project Swallowtail through the work of um, uh, the Garden Club of Toronto. I'm a member and I was involved in a project for the Metropolitan United Pollinator Garden. And I can see one of my co-conspirators, my teammate Liz is here. Thank you, Liz. And uh, together we tackled this um, project. We applied for a Pollinate TO grant and we got it and uh, we created a 100% native plant garden. This is the church that's located on Queen Street, just east of St. Mike's Hospital. If you're ever in the area, go take a look. It is lovely. What Pollinate TO did for us was the, the financial part was like the least amount, the, the least important part because they made connections, they introduced us to amazing groups and, um, Liz and I both uh, got to take part in the pollinator uh, stewardship course, and we became both certified pollinator stewards. And it was through that channel that I got to uh, learn about Project Swallowtail and the amazing work that they do. So, um, so before I get into the whole presentation, let me take a quick moment to thank a couple of people. And I'm going to start by thanking Toronto Parks and Forestry because they were instrumental in this new chapter, um, specifically the Pollinate TO grant. Um, I'm, I can't speak highly enough of it. Uh, anybody who wants to uh, hear me go on and on, I'll do a separate session dedicated to how amazing the program is. 
And I need to also thank the members of the Parks and Horticulture Branch for their amazing support for community volunteer projects. Um, Patricia Landry was my connection there. She gave me tons of great resources that I've distributed throughout the program as I've helped, you know, as I've worked on different cases. And, but um, I, I have been amazingly lucky with uh, the types of friends that I've made and the amazing volunteers that have joined me, um, including my friends, uh, family that I've coerced. And they stepped up to be my guides for the garden tour I heard uh, held in early September. And of course, I see she's on here. Um, my friend, the amazing Dorce, who's uh, done fantastic work with Cliffcrest Butterfly Way. Um, the more I get to know the different people like Dorte who are involved, the more I find kindred spirits who are willing to uh, really put themselves out there and make connections and um, expand urban wildlife habitat. So uh, Cliff, uh, Cliff Crest Butterfly Way is fantastic and uh, you should check it out for sure. And of course, let's not forget why we're all here because Project Swallowtails, where it's at. And the amazing organizers and volunteers at Project Swallowtail have built a community of care. Uh, some of the work people that I've had the great pleasure of working with are uh, Kathleen, Janaid, and of course, Pete. So uh, there's many, many more. The members are fantastic. But uh, Project Swallowtail is a really amazing project. And I'm going to I'm gonna spend the next half an hour telling you about why it's so amazing and what you can expect as you are part of it. So when, at the time that I became a, the, I was taking the pollinator stewardship certification course through Project Swallowtail, I was working on um, this high school uh, roundabout garden. This was for my daughter's high school and the principal wanted it to be beautified and I said, I would take it on. I would supply all the plant material as long as it was 100% native. And I enlisted, and um, you can see at the top right-hand corner, the TDSB delivered uh, soil and mulch at a distance, so we had to cart the whole thing over. But we used this cardboard lasagna method of just, instead of trying to pull the weed and disturb the soil, we just covered it and put fresh soil on top of it. And we created a series of pathways um, with uh, mulch where so this so people would walk without destroying the gardens and the students uh, came through and they got a lot of volunteer hours and they did a lot of heavy lifting and um, got the garden ready to go. And I had a lot of plants that I had started from seed already. So as you can see, I was already training to become a block ambassador. Not quite there but I was on my way. And so I had this little mini greenhouse in, in my garden where I start plants from seed and then I grow them in there. And then I was like, I've got my thing going on. And so uh, where it was through Project Swallowtail that I found, I was, I realized there was these amazing opportunities to get free native plant seedlings grown by members for projects like mine. So um, I, I got quite a few and I was humbled by the generosity of uh, all the people who donated I, from all over the city. And I visited Pete and he gave me a ton more and it was, uh, it was such an amazing feeling. So in September of last year, the students got together, we planted the garden. And if you wonder what the layout was, it was a true little mini botanical garden, 38 varieties. When I realized how amazing it was to get these seedlings, I thought, you know what? I need to pay back. So I became a block ambassador, which was leading the way of, you know, helping others discover the joy of um, being a part of something amazing in the community. And you may say, well, Sai, what's so special about native plants? And I'll tell you, you tell me your problem and I'll tell you how native plants can solve it. They're that good. 
this is actually in my garden. Which one do you think would be better? This beautiful blossoms and it's like this shower of golden color in the spring or this willow tree that looks like, oh, I've seen it everywhere. It's just like drooping leaves and stuff. What these cards refer to, these are actually part of cards that I do, uh, that I make for my garden tour. Japanese caria is an alien species. So it evolved, of course, in Japan, somewhere far, far away. It's ecosystem, the creatures that ate it, the, the provided, somewhere far away. It's like completely out of place here. But the willow evolved in this place and it's got this amazing web of life that surrounds it. We're talking about 455 different species of caterpillars that will eat the leaves. And so it supports this amazing biodiverse group of creatures. And so you'll say, well, isn't it better if something, I mean, aren't we taught as gardeners that you don't want stuff eating your plants and the first sign that you see something nibbling, you spray it away and I said, let's see where that gets us. Because interestingly, um, I'm, I should have probably set up a poll and asked everybody how many of you like birds. And I suspect that 100% of you would say you love birds. Who doesn't love birds, you know? Birds are amazing. So it turns out that baby birds in the first weeks of their life can only eat baby bird food, uh, or as we call it, caterpillars. They need high protein, little chunks of baby food burritos, and um, the parents uh, that's what they go and they hunt for. So if you don't have trees that support those caterpillars, you will never get, the babies will, will essentially starve. They don't have the ability to eat, eat anything else. So having caterpillars, native kinds, that will eat your plants in moderation is actually a good thing. And that's, and you can see in one of the trees, I have a silver maple and I have the magic number 297 on it. These are all from Doug Tallamy's book on bringing nature home, where he talks about this. And so um, I am proud of my silver maple because of that. Another thing is, let's do an informal poll. Who likes butterflies? I suspect everybody, everybody loves butterflies. Can't know. So butterflies are a very interesting situation, specifically the monarch butterfly. Let's take a look at that. Uh, these are all pictures from my garden. And you can see the monarch doesn't really have a mouth anymore. It's got a long um, um, straw uh, that it drinks nectar out of. And it drinks nectar out of a, a bunch of different flowers, many different flowers. Caterpillars are the worst. They will only eat certain types of um, leaves and the monarch caterpillar only eats milkweed. If it does not get milkweed, it would rather starve than try to eat anything else. So actually, I think this is, let me see. Yeah, look at that. And it's got a mouthpiece. This was a, and it can eat. I thought that's pretty cute. So let's take a look. What does that mean in the life cycle of a, mo of, a, of a monarch? Here I have these little carts. So I have the monarchs come up from Mexico. They mate, lay eggs. Oh, that's the egg on the, mon on the, uh, on the um, milkweed. The egg hatches. You got your little caterpillars that eat the milkweed, and then it starts to form the uh, chrysalis, and it turns into a monarch and goes back to Mexico. The only point in this life cycle where milkweed is involved is that one, that one place where the monarch caterpillars eat the milkweed. So if we take that out of the equation, 
there are no more butterflies. So for all of the, you who love butterflies, and I suspect it's all of us, um, we need the food that these insects have evolved over thousands of years to eat. It's not like they can say, oh, you know what? A couple million years, it's okay. I can switch to something else. That is the only thing. And the monarch is not unique in that sense. The more you look at it, there are these relationships. And so these are, these are the butterflies. I'm no butterfly expert, but they, these are the ones I found in my own garden. So I was like, oh, I wonder why they're here and what they like to eat. So while the butterfly, the red admiral, will go nectar, tea sap, mud, scat, which is a fancy word for poop, that's where they get nutrients. Uh, carrion, which is uh, dead things, because they need the minerals and nutrients. The caterpillar will only eat stinging nettle, nettles. In the case of the question mark butterfly, and you can see, again, lots of places to get that nectar and the liquids it needs, only very select few um, plants. And the black swallowtail, part of the dill family, members of the parsley family. And besides that, um, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Cynthia. We were we we were standing in in my garden. This is actually my garden, and one of the neighbors shouted, "Watch out!" And we looked, and there was a fox carrying this bunny, um, and its mouth just. That's actually, I think, my shadow. I was frozen and I was looking at it. And um, uh, Cynthia had the presence of mind to snap a picture. Everybody, nobody believes it was actually my front yard. But the funny thing is, when you think of foxes, you think bunny is what they eat. You would be surprised that a big part of a fox's diet is actually insects. It's not bunnies or not, or the or animals are not the only source of nutrition. They eat a lot of insects and um, beetles and um, uh, caterpillars and what they can. So they supplement their diet. So when we're talking about the in, caterpillars and butterflies and moths and insects, they affect everything in the wildlife that surrounds us. And another thing is you say, Sai, I have so many problems with pests. And, and I say, well, think about it. If you take a little step back, nature will help you take care of those pests. So I had, these were part of the seat sitting uh, group that I that we raised with my group and they were two swamp milk sweet seedlings and I noticed that uh, monarchs had laid eggs on them and um, I brought them in so I could keep a closer eye and see what was happening and I noticed and a lot of people noticed these yellow aphids they were all over the place this year and I have been organic for the past, ever since we moved to this house, since 2004, I have not used a single chemical in the garden. And I always wanted it to be a place where I could, I could feel comfortable with that there were no chemicals, no pesticides. I, I was like, I'm not gonna start now. What should I do? And I looked around and I thought, let's see what happens if we let nature take its, um, course. And, and what I found was that you see this little white thing happening here? That's, that's actually a lacewing egg. And lacewings are like these little green, they're, they're not butterflies, but little green butterfly-like creatures. Again, I'm not an entomologist. But their, their larvae have an extreme appetite, like they will devour aphids and I was like okay that's pretty good I think something good's happening and then I saw this um, little ladybug show up and it started munching away and um, you have to remember if you're if you have a clean environment and you're not disrupting it with chemicals nature will find a balance 
And they started munching on that. And I thought, that's pretty good. But the best part was I saw this. And it was some alien creature that was just, it was like slow motion, just grabbing and eating those aphids. And I was like, what is that? And so I pulled out my iNaturalist app and it said it was the long tailed, it was actually that same picture that I put into the app. It's a long tailed aphid eater. And I was like, that is cool. But what does it look like when it's grown up? And it was this, it's a hoverfly. And anybody, it's called the long tail aphid eater, I guess. Um, it's a hoverfly and you've seen them. They look like they like just go in their little flies and they hover. It's actually one of the most beneficial insects you can attract to your garden. So um, not having to do too much work in the garden gives me a lot of time to take pictures, if you've noticed. Um, I do very little work. And that's, again, another benefit of native plants, because they once they establish, they take care of themselves. There's no cleaning and organizing and planting. And it's just such a cool system. But that's another talk. And another thing is um, I don't believe in watering my garden, except for the veggies that I need to eat. But um, the rest of it, I try to plant with conditions and only in cases in the first year for them to get established and in cases of extreme drought. What I found is when you plant natives, they have these really immense root systems that go and if you get, let's give them a chance to get established, find water sources. This picture is actually a really nice one because you see over here, that's turf grass. That's the root that it has, as opposed to something like big blue stem with these beautiful, beautiful, the stretch down five feet, which is like a meter and a half underground. So not only they will go and get the water from down there, but they also create channels where extra rainfall can penetrate into the ground. And so you avoid flooding. I told you, I wasn't kidding. Like if you have a problem, I will solve it with native plants. They're that good. And so you said, I'm completely sold on native plants. I believe that I have to go that way. What is my next day? I said, let's talk about Project Swallowtail. And Project Swallowtail is, um, it's, it's about neighbors building community and uh, street by street, people getting together and working together to restore nature in Toronto. Essentially building urban wildlife habitat so we can have a balanced life. And um, I'll, I'll show you a little, this is, I, I have a little thing of explaining. I was thinking, how do I explain it? So this is my little attempt of explaining. So here we have two friends. Each of them has grown a variety of uh, seedlings in one pot, two different. And um, once they've, they've sprouted, each friend will divide it into individual pots because then they don't compete with each other and they grow larger. And the second friend says, oh, that's a good idea. So now they have 10 potted seedlings. And what they do is they give half of what they have grown to a community project. And then they trade between themselves and says, oh, I'll give you some of that. And if you give me some of this. And now it's like an absolute win-win. So you have a chance, a stock of really good plants, native plants, where you can make a community project. And you have two friends who now have each have two different varieties. So that's essentially what it is. And you say, well, say, what happens if there are five people? And I say, funny, you should ask, because I have that. Here we have five people. And keep your guys on the guy with the cell phone. Now, I've heard that there are people like this. Nobody in my group was on their cell phone all the time. But let's say hypothetically, if you have somebody who's on a cell phone all the time, how does that affect their seat sitting? 
Well, first, everybody gives half to a community project. The slick animation courtesy of PowerPoint. And then they all trade. Woo now you have a great stock of plants for community project and everybody's got five different plants. And what do I mean by community? Well, community can mean different things. Um, one of the first events that I ran was uh, seedlings that were actually donated by Pete. I hadn't grown any of these, but these were for Project Swallowtail that first year. Um, uh, set up a plant giveaway and a garden tour. So people who came, um, I had cards where they could learn about the plant and choose which plant to take home with them and grow in their garden. That's one way of defining community and where those plants can go to. Another way it was uh, this amazing project, my friend Heidi, who's another member of Project Swallowtail, contacted me and said, we've got this great project that we're putting in a native plant garden in front of East York Collegiate. Do you have anything from your seed sitting group? And I said, I do. So I gave it to her and she kindly sent me this picture afterwards. So this is another example of a community project. And then this one. So um, these are two Project Swallowtail members. Uh, it's um, Christina built the stand and Stephen took the picture. And it's just, it's, it's a stand they had on the side of the street with free plants. Anybody walking by could pick one. You don't necessarily have to know the people, but it's about encouraging people to grow native plants. And then another example, is a, one of the members of my seed sitting group, one group within the group that I led last year was led by Linda and at the St. Clair Church. And they were a phenomenal group. And I'm gonna go more into the details of why they were so amazing. But um, they were applying for a Polynateo grant when I met them. They didn't know if they were gonna get it or not, but they were so passionate about converting their lawn to native plants, they said, we're gonna sign up and do seed sitting. We're gonna have plants whether or not we get the grant. Anyway, their idea was so good, they did end up getting the grant, but they had these amazing community outreach days like they connected with the school and they gave seedlings to the students and they had the students come over and do plantings with them. It, it was just such an amazing experience. So it can be any way that you feel you can reach out to members of your community and share uh, the love of native plants and help them see um, and give them an opportunity to see what a native plant can do for them in, the, uh, in, in their own garden. So what does a year of seed sitting look like? And I'm gonna be frank with you. The reason I'm doing this presentation is to see um, if, uh, if I give this kind of information to people in advance, does it change their outlook? And they maybe give them a better idea of what to expect. And um, this was the first year that I did seed sitting. So I thought, I documented it and that's the process I'm gonna share with you. So for native plants in Canada, they are all perennial. So they are not expect, they, they come back year after year. And um, for them to germinate, they have very specific needs and that they have a built in, let me see. So they have, uh, the, this is like the seed pack. This is a seed pack that I prepared that I gave to member participants. And the germination, this is what it looks like when it germinates. For this to happen, there's a very specific thing that needs to happen, which is called stratification. That means in order for the seed to wake up, it needs to go through a cold period, whether uh, you put it in a fridge or whether you put it outside. 
it needs that cold period. Otherwise, the seed, if you just plant it directly, not going to wake up. And this is a defense mechanism for seeds to um, know that winter is over before they start growing so they don't get killed off. Um, but what this means is that we're going to be doing winter sowing, which we will let nature, uh, protected nature, let's just put it that way, do the work for us while we sit. That's the seed sitting, okay? Pretty, I'm not the one who came up with that term, as Pete came up with that term, but it's, it's, it's a very interesting concept. To keep my group organized, I uh, created a blog. This is the Saya Sun Studio is my go-to page for any single hobby that I have. It's got a book on there. It's got the publishing. It's a, a YouTube channel. It's it's my thing. So I was like, why not? I'll put a blog on there too. So I because I wasn't sure how the emails were getting through or not. And I was trying to find a way to motivate people in the middle of COVID. I started this blog and um, the, the thing was that there is a form here for the Underhill Seat Sitter notification. People have to opt in. Uh, it's a two-step two process. So, um, and what happens is every time I have a new blog post, they get a little email like the one down here that says, hey, there's a new post. And um, for those who signed up, it was quite successful. Uh, incidentally, on the same page, you'll see I have a, I've added a little link. It says sign up this on this link to join the seat sitting group. That's um, where there's a form that you can sign up to be part of this amazing once in a lifetime fantastic seat sitting group, but let me tell you more. So um, in November, December, I, um, I had uh, the friends that I had um, uh, corralled into uh, coming and joining me um, came by uh, and I distributed supplies and seats to them. It was a good chance to meet, but it would have been nicer if we had we could have done it like as a more of a community project, but it was um, smaller groups of people. And at the same time, I had a follow up session for the Lee Side High School Eco Club who had done the plantings. And they, they were eager to know what these varieties they had planted on would look like. So I showed them pictures from my garden of because that's where a lot of them came of what the plants were and what they were going to do. And they were so excited. They, they wanted to take part in seat sitting as well. So I decided to make individual kits for them. And this is a picture of, of what would be. And I did this drawing of uh, this is a picture of what would be in the kit. So it was a pot with the rolled up booklet. And it had a seat pack and some chicken wire and a bag of soil. And the idea was I would I distribute these and you can see all of these things. I would distribute this. They would put two thirds of the soil inside the pot, sprinkle the seeds. We were headed into another lockdown. So I was just trying to get these into their hands and I wasn't gonna talk to them. Sprinkle the seeds, put the label, put the remainder of soil on top, cover it with chicken wire and leave it outside. Now, leaving it outside is a critical point because you want nature to do its thing and to stratify them and to help them germinate. The chicken wire is your defense against squirrels because even though you think they are asleep, they will come and they will dig anything that of value. If, if it's valuable, they will dig. Even if it's not valuable, they will dig because that's what squirrels do. And uh, so chicken wire is your, your defense against squirrels. And after the snow around May, that's when you'll see your little seedlings start to sprout and you divide it. Easy, okay? Let's get into details. So being very interested in tracking the success of this project, because I love 
tracking things and I love seeing how things work out. I created a spreadsheet. It's actually shared on, if you wanna see what's on here, um, I have it as part of one of the entries on the blog. So uh, essentially I had um, four groups that I was mentoring essentially. One was my friends and family and neighbors that I had hunted down and begged and everything. And some of them came willingly to join me. Another group was the St. Clair Church, which was a standalone group. I would go to the church and hand out this. I handed out seeds over there. I went for a potting up session. Linda and another great uh, leader, Becky, were the two people that did most of the talking and maintaining of that group. Um, so having that connection was fantastic. There was, as a member of Garden Club of Toronto, this past year has been a big year for us because it has been our 75th anniversary and the year of the garden. So there was thought of um, having some kind of a program, some kind of a collective gardening program where we would raise plant seedlings, native seedlings for a, some kind of project with the Toronto Botanical Gardens, which is where we meet, which is our home. We, we are a founding partner of it. So it was our way of giving back. And so uh, that group was very, spe the very specific types of plants that we were growing for that. And the last group was the Lee Side um, High School group. And um, by the time I managed to go there, there was only seven or eight students uh, who showed up to collect seeds. We were almost in lockdown. They, they called the uh, um, winter break early, and but I got something into their hands. And uh, the, that last green section is me because I took all the difficult ones and all the leftover ones and all the ones that I just really wanted to grow to see what it would look like and I put them all into me. This is uh, another one, 61 varieties that we tackled as a group. So how did it go? Interestingly, I've crossed out the red ones. Those are the seeds that um, for some reason didn't grow or um, the member didn't follow up. On. I never saw the like of it again. And um, then there are uh, and more interestingly for me was the number of people that actually followed the program through to the end was only 90 out of the 49 that I started out with. And this is why I'm doing this program today, because I want to increase the, the rate of people staying on this program to 100%, maybe even higher. That is not only you stay you bring somebody else in. And um, I was interested, I kept telling people, even if your plants didn't grow, to show pictures to me, tell me why, let's find out. And to me, it's, it's about every time trying to make things a little bit better, finding out the process, how I can improve the process and make it easier to understand. Was it something I didn't say? Was it something I didn't do? Was it a misconception? Let's find out. So, uh, and there were people who had no plants, but they were eager. And so they came to plant exchanges and I said, don't worry. I mean, I had varieties that didn't grow. Why don't we share the ones that did grow and we'll go from there. And so it was a really positive experience. And a lot of the people that stayed said, you know what? First time didn't work. I'm in it and I'm gonna come back next year. Oh, interesting fact is um, with the Lee side group, um, at one point, I don't know if the teachers were really burned out or there was stuff going on or something. At one point, they said, you know what, we're done. I'm like, what about the gardeners? We're done. So what about the seeds? So having the right kind of connection. So I contrast that with St. Clair's group, where it was a very successful group as opposed to Lee side, which I have no idea what happened to them where they are. Um, it really depends on your connection with particular groups and 
um, how, you know, how people follow through with that. So in December, I completed the construction of my seat sitting command center. And I, I built this custom rack and um, not my myself, my husband, I have to give him credit, was fantastic. And um, in, for the 50 or 60 varieties that I was growing, I put them all in trays and labeled them. And instead of doing individual um, chicken wire, I covered the whole thing. This front actually clips on so I could just roll it up and there was a bungee cord that I could tie up the roll up here so I could see all of these. And you'll notice that they're all covered in snow. A big part of it is you want to make sure they're covered in snow. I would go and shovel snow onto them so that when it warms up, it would gradually melt. You don't want them to dry out, but you also want containers that have good drainage holes because if they don't, it rots. I, I knew there was one person in my group who said, I've, I've this American way, I've seen it. It's like jugs and just put it in. I think she may have forgotten to put drainage holes or they weren't sufficient because everything rotted. So you want to have good drainage. And one other problem that I had with my situation was because these were so shallow, first of all, they dried out very quickly. And secondly, this, this whole corridor by the side of our house is very windy. So the wind, when we had those big windstorms, it would flip the tray over. And so I had a very interesting game of guess that seedling, which is not something I'm gonna play again this year. And I was be like, which one is it? I have 60 choices. Do the leaves look like? So you, you don't wanna play that game. It, it can be nerve wracking. And when you get to the point where you're like, I am done, I throw it out. And the week after you throw it out, you identify that it was Joe Pie Wheat. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very sad game you don't wanna play. But my seat sitters were fantastic and they sent me pictures of their setups. And I, I wanna bring your attention. You'll see that this particular group, this tray is actually on a balcony. And that's the thing, the big equalizer for a program like this is you can grow it anywhere you like. It can be on a balcony. And the, the nice thing for me was in um, around April, I decided to, I, I noticed the first little specks and you'll see over here, these little tiny little, this little green thing. And a couple of hours like, whoa, it worked. And because of the wind issue that I had, I decided to just cover the holes. I took out the front mesh and I just covered the whole thing with plastic and it did wonders because the temperature difference between the outside and the inside was often up to 10 degrees and they were protected. And things really started to happen. So I'm gonna show you a picture. This is my Virginia wild rye, April 17th. So this is in the span of essentially two weeks. This is how much it grew. So at this point in April, you are no longer sitting with those seats. You're gonna start a marathon and it's, you're gonna be running. And this is the part that you need to be prepared for. Up to now, it's been like, set it and forget it. You set it out there, you let it snow, maybe check on for some water and stuff. But at this point onward is when things really start to happen. So April 17th, and you can see I've got the little tiny foxglove beer tongue, tiny little specks coming the week after. Take a look at this. This one, I thought it was my tall thimble weed, but it wasn't. It was actually an ace hyssop. And April 26 is when these little guys show up. And you can see I've got stuff happening in all the different trays. And again, almost every single tray had stuff growing. But you'll also notice that the trays are very dry. So in May, I was essentially out there watering every single day 
because I didn't want to kill off the seedlings. They need to be kept moist at this point. So every time I blinked, something would dry out. And May 28th, so a mere five weeks later, suddenly I was potting up hundreds of seedlings. I pulled out my little mini greenhouse um, to keep them warm as I moved them out of the, the covered shelf. And remember those little mini, these, these are the anise hyssop that I showed you. Within a span of five, four weeks, maybe less. So it was, it was intense because remember the Virginia wild rye? That's, that's the Virginia wild rye. <laughs> they really, this is, this is a swamp milkweed. Things really started to grow. So I was, re, I was potting up all these little containers suddenly yielded hundreds of seedlings and I was running around and potting up Virginia wild rye. <laughs> This is, this is just two months later. And so one of the misconceptions is when you tell people seedlings, they think it's going to be this tiny little thing. But when it starts growing, if you water it, if you keep it in a warm place, if you give it the conditions, fertilize it, give it good potting soil, it takes off. And so um, by June 18th, June 18th was when I was set to go back to uh, St. Clair Church and help them divide their seedlings. I loaded up the car with a bunch of seedlings. I think, I, I, I don't know, 30, 40, 60 something seedlings that I loaded up and I took over and I set up this table. And, um, and they came in with their seedlings and you'll notice these are much smaller because they hadn't warmed them up, put them in a sheltered place. But what happened is I showed them how to divide. They potted it up and I, and I gave them a bunch of seedlings and it was fantastic. So that's an example of a group that was very successful. And by the end of June, I had some seedling swaps. So this was my garden at that point and um, the raised beds, we just finished a massive garden renovation. That's why it looks so good. It never looks this good. Next year, it won't look this good. And um, I had all the seedlings and I made little signs for them explaining what they are and what growing conditions. And then my seed sitters, they could come and swap. They could give me stuff, take stuff, or even if they didn't have it, they could just take stuff. Because that's the reason I had benefited from the generosity of so many that previous year. I was determined to give back. So stuff and then keeping track of all the stuff coming in and going out was crazy of crazy fun. By August, um, those remember the little anise hyssop that I showed you? This is what they were. They were about half a meter tall, fully blooming, gorgeous, covered in bees all the time. And uh, it was just fantastic. People would come in and say, this is better than any garden center and um, walk away with great plants. So I'll give you examples that my group was involved with, with community engagement. And, and these are things, so you can be either thinking of places where these seedlings from Project Swallowtail can grow, go to, or you can be growing four particular ones. And, um, and I just wanted to say that we, of the ones that we managed to grow, there were about 51 varieties of plants. It's, you name it, it's probably on here. Some of them were only a couple. Um, some of them, for example, the um, Virgin's Bower was actually seedlings that Dorte gave me. I didn't grow those personally, but it was a great collection. And I, I estimate at one point I stopped keeping track because I, it, it's like a job. And, but about 1,500 seedlings were grown and distributed. And an interesting thing I should mention to you is, so last year we, it was pretty much as long as it's native, we were growing it. This year, Project Swallowtail has a focus on milkweeds for the monarch butterfly. You know that there are declining numbers, so they are focusing on um, specifically milkweed. You can grow other things, but milkweeds and late season sources of nectar, for example. 
Um, here you have swamp milkweed, which is a gorgeous pink one. World milkweed, I grew these from seeds two years ago and they bloomed and it, obviously they were tasty because something ate them right away. I'm like, okay, okay, it's coming back next year and maybe it's gonna be more so you don't eat all of it. Butterfly milkweed is fantastic. Poke milkweed, one of the few that grows in full shade. And purple milkweed, which is gorgeous, which I'm gonna be adding to my uh, thing. And of course, the common milkweed. So these are um, six varieties that uh, are native to our parts. And we're gonna be promoting specifically for monarch habitat loss. But also these are pictures from my own garden. Um, we're going to be looking at spotted Joe pie weed and look at the pollen sacs on that little bee. Come on, you got to say that's that's pretty impressive. Um, and um, jo Joe pie weed, as well as the varieties of golden rods and anybody who's come to my house knows where I stand on golden rods, I will sing their praise because when everything else stops blooming, those golden rods are buzzing with life. And um, this was, a, I spent a lot of time taking pictures of bees and stuff, but this little guy was just flying to my old uh, early goldenrod and it bloomed from July all the way to October. So it should be early and late goldenrod, like, you know, New England aster, which of course has Toronto's official bee, the bicolored sweat bee on there proudly. Um, and so um, we're going to be focused on those. So uh, the milkweed, the six milkweeds, joe pie, spotted joe pie, asters, and golden rods. But of course, there's going to be more of everything else as well. So for my garden tour, I already mentioned that I had, um, I enlisted the help of my friends and uh, family and um, they came and we had a great time. About 25 visitors came through. Um, I estimate about 187 plants that were given away on that day. And this is what I was talking about. Look at those beautiful literature, all thanks to uh, um, Parks and Forestry. And um, actually one of my volunteer tour guides, Deb, who's standing right at the at this end is um, lives in Burlington and she's going to be starting a seat sitting group in that area. So anybody who's looking for connections, um, I will be happy to put you in touch with her. But uh, it was great because people came by, they could get resources, they could get um, uh, plants and it was fantastic. And um, all kinds of interesting bits of information all around. So those are the volunteers. I mentioned to you the Garden Club of Toronto, we grew 125 plants uh, and at a ceremony in September, we presented, it, presented them to Roger Getting, the new director of the Toronto Botanical Gardens in uh, honor of our 75th anniversary. And there were a couple of my um, seat sitters that were there with me to share the joy, but uh, their names are all on here. So that was a very lovely group. And uh, all those plants are now in the perennial garden beds uh, at TBG. And St. Clair, I've already sung their praises, um, but these are the two dynamic ladies who made it happen. Um, led by Linda and Becky there. Um, they made these beautiful gardens and they, it was really, I, I went for a couple of days to see the work that was being done and um, they were a really amazing group and they kindly sent me the before and after pictures. And so very impressive. And again, and I got to see the way that the kids were engaged. A couple of, I saw a small, a small videos, of course, can't share that, but it was very well done of how they engaged the children and got them involved. And it was really a very good interactive project. And you can see just that spare spot converted into a thriving hub. 
I'd like to give a shout out to another great friend, Susan, who's at Brimwood Boulevard School. And um, this is a school I work closely with. Um, I had a seed, CD Saturday workshop and I had a whole bunch of sprouted seeds. So I gave them to Susan who used them in a project with her class. And afterwards I went and saw their native plant garden and as part of Project Swallowtail, put down some pathways to make it accessible for the children, identified it. And um, we just gave 69 plants and more to come in the spring. And these were primary school children who planted them and uh, it, it's absolutely lovely. Another great friend I made along the way was uh, Mag, who uh, works. And so I, I say this gardening knows no bounds. She uh, leads the Port Perry Care and Share Community Permaculture Garden. She works there. And we were having a discussion about native plants. And she said, I want to get some seeds. And I was like, what for? And she says, I want to add it to a garden. And I said, you want to add plants to a garden? I'm all there. So. I drove up, I, I was itching to go to native plants in Claremont anyway. So I said, why don't I meet you there? Because I have to go check out, see what new plants they have. So we met there and I gave her seeds. And then of course my car was empty. So I, I had to get something, but she sent me pictures and it looks wonderful. And I'm hoping that she will lead a seat sitting group uh, up at Port Perry and um, get her members of that community growing native plants as well. And this is a friend of mine, another one of my seat sitters, Veronica from Garden Club of Toronto, um, leads the uh, this Rotary Cheshire Apartments. Um, it's a project on behalf of Garden Club where they go and they help the residents there. Um, Liz is also involved with that. And I gave, uh, quite a few um, plants uh, to be added to their gardens. So um, they, they specifically wanted things with a lot of aroma and not toxic. And so we were pretty selective about the plants that we chose. And of course, this is my good friend Heidi's project, which she gave a shout out. And that's the way a lot of projects and Project Swallowtail works is if you, if you come across a worthy project, you reach out and say, who has plants for this project right now? And I had a bunch of grass seedlings and I said, would you like these? And she said, yes, of course. And so she kindly sent me these pictures. And um, again, it's fantastic to see community involvement. And so another project is my friend, Cynthia, who, was, who took the picture of that amazing picture of that fox. Uh, she um, has a connection with Essex uh, Public School, which is uh, near Christie Pitts. And um, I, I, they were starting a native plant garden. So I gave some plants to start it off, but um, they, they already had some other things as well. But um, they are interested. So going forward, this group is interested in um, being uh, having one of their classes uh, raise native plants from seed the children. So I've got to work out the details, but there's probably going to be one class from Essex that's going to be joining uh, Project Swallowtail. From Seacord, I know that I was in touch with Satinder. They have already, they are way ahead of the game. They have a beautiful native plant gardens. They have a fantastic parents council, and but they're looking at doing more. And there is a discussion of having another seat sitting uh, workshop with in that school. And uh, the biggest project I expect, and I'll find out next week when I go visit them, is Lawrence Park Collegiate, which is at Avenue and um, Lawrence. And it's an it's a one of Toronto's older schools built in 1935. I just found that out. And um, they have uh, two environmental studies courses happening in the winter. And as part of that, they're looking at uh, seat sitting as part of their courses and building the native plant garden. 
And on top of that, I heard they have a greenhouse. So it's, I think that's gonna be my new home there. I'm just gonna go live in that school. But um, it's, uh, we're looking at sites and ways of engaging the children. And of course, if you're interested, please uh, sign. You can use this form. Um, I think we're gonna put the link in the chat. And of, um, at, there's the notification for the newsletter, but also, well, it's just the blog post that says something's been posted. But also, this is the form I'm going to use. And if you are not in Toronto, but you would like seats, that's another option. Um, for people in Toronto, I'll be happy to give you pots, soil, chicken wire, uh, seeds, all the basic stuff, essentially the kit. And I'll even throw in one of those really amazing Toronto wildlife booklets um, that I've been fortunate to get. But for if you're outside of Toronto, I would, I would be bankrupt if I mailed those to you, but I can mail seats. So that is an option. You can do it anywhere and get your friends and you can have so much fun. So I would like to thank you for joining me for this presentation. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. And I hope that you consider becoming a seat sitter and seeing all the great things it can lead to.